Hello there, Metal Summoners. How are you guys doing today? Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Thank you, as always, for joining us here on the Island of Misfit Toys with all of your favorites, the Psycho Steve, Angel Alamo, Bobby Dreyer, coming at you live from Disney, and I am Jay. Thank you, as always, for joining us. We hope you guys had a great holiday and you guys are staying healthy and happy. But enough about us, because let's bring in the guy, the man of the hour, yeah. as long as we're able to have him on here with us. Guitarist extraordinaire, Mr. Phil X is with us. What's up, Yay. boys? There's Diana. <laughs> Diana. Oh, my God. You know, you know. I, can't my, uh, I can't call my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> but first and foremost, man, how are you, man? How are you doing, and how was your holiday so far? Um, dude, holidays were great. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, New Year's Eve, doesn't when you have kids, it doesn't happen that much anymore. You know, you're in bed for the, the hour of uh, – question but i'h um, looking forward to 2022 there's a lot of things cooking I'm excited about that Christmas was was fantastic my wife is uh she's Santa and she's an incredible Santa and uh and the kids are going nuts right and you know it's funny because, you know when you're a guitar player the little you know the little gash that's yeah. uh that's like Wow, man, you gotta be careful when you play guitar. I go, dude, at one in the morning when you're putting a Barbie dream house together and you cut your hand open, and you're a dad first. Yes, absolutely, for sure. It may not be hoarding if it's guitars, but you're still a dad first. Dude, and, you, and, and Barbie dream house came out pretty good, too. That's awesome, man. That is so super cool. So, Phil, let's uh, let's touch base just first and foremost, just right about the main gig. You are, of course, the guitar player for Bon Jovi and have been for quite a quite a while now. So you were um, j jamming in and out with Bon Jovi, filling in for Richie here and there, um, and then, of course, became a permanent member. So overall, talk a little bit about your history with doing bon a live show, knowing the guys and what kind of led up to the gig. I thought you were doing well, it's it's kind of funny because I was talking about it the other day when, uh, you know, it's it still sounds like a joke when people go, "Hey, what band you play for?" I go, "I play in Bon Jovi," and they're like, "Wait, so you play in a tribute band?" And I go, "No, I play in Bon Jovi." So I don't even say that anymore. People are like, "Hey, you in a band?" I go, "No, man, I'm a plumber." I don't want to <laughs> even open the conversation anymore, you know? like because it sounds like it sounds like a lie. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I play in Bon Jovi on Monday, and on Tuesday I play in Van Halen. On Wednesday, that's the big day. That's that's that plan. You know, because it's, it's just sounds like I'm I'm making shit up. But with the people that know, you could be in a Starbucks, and if somebody comes in and wants a selfie, then everybody's like, "Wait, who is that guy?" And then it, and then it gets around. Then the Starbucks becomes a meet and greet. Mm -hmm. So I just I just shut up. That's basically it. But. I mean, what a gig to have, right? I mean, <laughs> it's it's a mega gig, you know. Um, you got to hand it to John. He's he he made all the right uh, decisions, and uh, he's still relevant. And we're going out and doing arenas next year, so uh, that's great. That. That's hey, awesome. Um, for for so sure. I, I got to jump in on this real quick with you yeah, doing Bob. that and everything, and. Uh, Look, we've had a great friend of our show, and we're good friends with Kulik. Steve yeah. Brown, who's been on, you guys have been living the fucking dream. You really have. You you know, it, it's kind of like, look, like I said, oh, Diana, your grandmother, when, look, when I was in a car and she gave me a kiss, and I'm like sitting there going, I've known her for 20 years. That thing doesn't it make you feel surreal? It you know, is surreal. That you you know what? I gotta I gotta say, because I was a fan, right? Like I bought my own tickets and took my girlfriend of to the, the New Jersey uh concert. It was at the CNE Grandstand in Toronto that isn't even there anymore. And if somebody would have said, Hey, you're gonna be playing that band in a bunch of years, I'd be like, You're crazy. Like who would have <laughs> who would have thought, right? But it's 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 kind of like a uh it's surreal because even in 2013, when I went originally out to fill in, but then Richie didn't come back, like in 2011. Yeah, I was I was on my 80th show. You know, you wake up in a jet and look over, and you're like, "Holy shit, it's John Bon Jovi!" And then you realize, "Wait, dude, you just you just did 80 shows." 
<laughs> you know, it's still one of you still get that surreal moment like is this really happening and then you realize that yeah it is and uh you know but so here i want to go the other way too look you're an accomplished musician you're you know nobody can take that shit away from you you steve brown Kulik, you know there are so many people that i sit there and i'm going look dude you paid your dues and if these di people didn't respect you they wouldn't have brought you on today i talked to a gentleman who played on your album and you played on his and he apologized he couldn't jump on tonight mr doug pinnock Love but again the dougie 71 fucking years old yeah. king's x everything the song he did on your album, what you did on his, and I'm going, man, uh, you know, it, 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 just hearing the accolades. Again, Mark Hudson, I brought it up earlier prior. We were talking, Mark, who wrote Living on the Edge and everything, and you said you only meant you must have did something that you sparked that he just said, wow, this guy's authentic, genuine, and, and these people know, know that, man. So... Kudos to you, brother. Thanks, man. I just, you know what? I just, uh, I kept my feet on the ground and I just, I know, you know, sometimes it's a job, but sometimes it's, uh, it's always from the heart. And I think people get that, you know, I never, I never tried to get this gig. I didn't want to, you know, I, I was just presented an opportunity, but people say it's about being at the right place at the right time. But I think it's about delivering the goods. Because even if you're at the right place in the right time when somebody knocks on that door, if you don't bring the goods, then you're not sticking around. You're 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 sending you home, you know. And I, I feel like I was really prepared, and I was really uh, I did the the background work for when I was in everybody's face and. I knew not to be me. I knew I, I knew if like this is a guy you're filling in for and this is you, it's somebody that shows up that's in the middle that does the job. Yeah, but let me say this. Look, I, I, I heard a great compliment this week. Uh, Eddie Trunk, uh, or it was, I forget who was interviewing. Uh, I think it was Alan Light was interviewing uh, Ace Frilly and Ace was talking about Kulik. And he said the great thing about Bruce was the way that Bruce would do Ace's solos, but he would incorporate himself. Look, you're you're doing a great justice for Richie, but you're yeah. really allowing yourself to shine through. And and that's what's really neat. Phil said the same thing. He goes, Look, I can't play like Viv or you know, Phil, uh, Steve Brown. And he goes, I just play like me, but they trust him to do the job. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's, you gotta, it's a, a judgment and I, I just made the right choices. Like you can't stray from the solo to living on a prayer. You can't yeah. stray from the solo for wanted dead or alive. So I'm doing that solo the way it is, you know, um, there are times where we do keep the faith and uh, John's like, man, do your thing. They let me off the leash. I run across the stage and, and shred like Phil X and, and that's my moment. And yeah. for the rest of the two and a half hours, <laughs> it's a little, it's a little uh, flexibility going on, you know, but I mean, you know, it's like, uh, it's, but when it's when you meet people too, you know, like when I met Doug and Doug and when I met Steve and it's funny because when we were in 2019, we were in Europe and Steve and his daughter came out to a show. I think it was Vienna. No, it was, if it was in Vienna, it was in Germany somewhere. But, uh, you know, running into your friends in other parts of the world, that's an awesome thing, too. You know? <laughs> but I feel like the thing with Doug is uh, I love I love when you have a community. Uh, and, and it's friends. Uh -huh. And it's, hey, man, uh, can you sing on my record? And he's like, yeah, uh, of course, man. Or you, you at, and then he's like, hey, can you do a solo on my solo record? And I'm like, Send me the track, man. And it's that's how it works. It's not like, you know, you know, what's it pay? It's not, um, yeah. it's like, you know, but musically, you know, it does, and that's, that's really important to me. Cause even Tico, like we, I love drummers. I, I know a lot of amazing drummers being from being a session guy in LA. Yeah. But 
when I, you know, I got Tico Torres on the next Drills record because we were on tour and <laughs> and we had a day off. And Tico loves his days off. He wants to go golfing or something, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, hey, bud, you know, if, if I get a studio on the day off, will you come in and play drills? I mean, drums on a drills track. And he's like, yeah, man, of course. I'll do anything for you. And then we go into the studio and I got a drum track from Tico. So, I mean, that kind of thing is is more important to me than than anything. You know, if Tico said, hey, I need a guitar on something tomorrow, I would I would be set up and ready to go tomorrow. You know, it's not, hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of busy until next Tuesday. I would, there's people that have done stuff for me that I would, would drop oh. I'm there, you know? And, I, and that's really important. You know, even the first Drills record, the volume one of Stupid Good Lookings, where we got, you know, I got Brent Fitz and Taylor Hawkins and uh, Glenn Sobel and Abel Boreal Jr. and Randy Cook, is, who was a, a, another Torontonian in front of mine. I mean, all these guys just came in and played drums, and it was like they were in the band for an hour and a half, and and that was it. We made music, and then Volume Two um, is guys like Ray Luzier and uh, Tom, Tommy Lee, and let me silence that, and um, <laughs> all these and all these guys. It's just you know, it's a really really important community, and that and that's. When people put you in that circle, you kind of feel like you've done really good things in your life. It's pretty awesome. Well, you have, and, and it's been great, and we love it. And I'm going to throw it back to you, Jay. But yeah. Phil, you know, look, I love puffing your head up because I've been, <laughs> we've been blowing this show up for a couple of weeks, and everybody who's been here from David Fishhoff, Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. Everything. Oh my God, you guys got Phil and never. Everybody has been singing your effing praise. Not just everything you've done on your, but dude, thank you because look, you you kept the shit going, and you know I I, I love that. We all love that. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate you appreciate you guys, even though we just kind of met. But I feel like <laughs> I just feel like you know. Good people attract good people. I think that's how it works, you know? Oh, yeah. Absolutely, 100%. So, Phil, before I segue up to Steve for the next part, I wanted to bring it real quick back to Bon Jovi because something you said kind of got me curious where you were saying that you went and you were a fan. You went, you know, with your girlfriend to see them on the early tours and stuff like that. And, yeah. you know, we're all Bon Jovi people as well. And now you've got your stamp on current Bon Jovi material, which has got feel absolutely fantastic but are there some particular bon jovi tracks that you're very excited when you get to play them live you know like i happen to be very connected personally to like have a nice day i mean yeah. slippery when wet and new jersey which features bad medicine all bulletproof records um have a nice day just happens to be a track that i connect with but are there any classic tracks that now you get that you still get excited that man now i get to play that well, you know what's funny? It's it's somebody asked me that today. It's like uh, so. Living on a prayer is a song of my youth, right? And and yeah. when you're on a stage with that band, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. As soon as that talk box kicks in, I've, you've never seen an audience get as electric as that moment, and it still happens. And even though I've done it two hundred times or more. Yeah, it is more. Um, I still get goosebumps, man. Nice. I still get goosebumps playing Living on a Prayer. And then there's other songs, Have a Nice Day is also, and it's funny because I bang my head like crazy <laughs> and have a nice day. But I don't do it to the riff, I do it to the beat. And he came up to me one time and he goes, how do you do that? <laughs> like, what? You're playing one thing and you're headbanging to something else. I don't know how you do it. And I'm like, I don't know, dude. I can't even explain it. If I try, I might lose it. So let's let's not talk about it. Nice. But it's, there's moments in, in the show. Uh, and I learned a lot of things. Like, for instance, like you're saying, in the U.S., you have your Slippery When Wet and your New Jersey and those records and the classics. And Bulletproof, 
you you said it those two words bulletproof those records are bulletproof when you go over to europe their favorite record for the most part is these days which i never knew existed until i had to learn songs from it for the tour so it's uh it's the world just loves this band man. it's like yeah. an incredible yeah. incredible thing that that has legs and this, yeah. those legs just keep going <laughs> No, I think that's super duper cool. And and one thing, because like when you get to have those moments, it's it's true. And you reminded me of a story that a former guest of ours told us where we had Martin Motnick on the show not long ago, who's the bass player in Accept. Yeah. And wow. he was talking about when he would sit down with Wolf and talk about a song like Balls to the Walls, which Wolf Hoffman now has been playing for 40 years. And there's always that talk of, do you get sick of playing these songs? And Martin was telling us how, when he talked to Wolf about it, Wolf was like, I can't get tired of it. Because when you see the crowd react to when it's time for that song and that intro kicks in, yeah. you just get energized to play it because of the way the crowd just upped their game. So I thought it was really cool the way you talked about the when the talk box kicks in and then the crowd just pops off. As I was like, that's really, really cool to now have another member of a huge band say that this classic song that's got all these years of having legs just really still pops the crowd. So I think that was super cool. It's, it's really amazing because um, John knows how to front a band. So, yeah. and, and he knows when to introduce a song and he knows when to let the riff speak for itself. Nice. You know, <laughs> um, and it's, it's pretty amazing being in a situation. I've, I've learned so much from all these guys, you know, mm -hmm. through the course of my tenure. And it just feels like, it just feels like a family. Sometimes it feels like a family. Sometimes it feels like a gang. Sometimes it feels like just a brotherhood that is just cement like nobody's going anywhere this is the rock and roll this is amazing on the, on the back of my head though you, i have to now that i said it's like a brotherhood in cement i feel like hey man this is rock and roll the biggest selling tours in the world are reunions <laughs> yeah <laughs> i can get the call anytime hey so um you know whatever I, I maybe not maybe you never know my whole point is that i'm just really grateful for what I'm doing, and I'm really grateful for what I've done, and it's just that uh, it just it keeps rolling, and it's awesome. It's awesome. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely yeah. Phil, without a doubt. Psycho Steve, it is time for that smile and that voice, and you, my friend. Okay, so you mentioned you were a Bon Jovi fan before you joined Bon Jovi, of course. But yeah. what was the band that made you pick up the guitar? Mm. Actually, it was my dad that made me pick really? up the guitar. Because he played bazooki and he needed a guitar player. <laughs> I mean, that's what I say. It's a joke. I was five. Um, you know, yeah. five plastic ukuleles to see what the fingers could do, and then I actually asked for a guitar for my for, for Christmas when I was five. And we were in a modest home. You know, it was my dad, my mom, four kids, and sometimes my grandparents in a two bedroom apartment in downtown Toronto, and. I asked for an electric guitar and he got me one. And uh, that still blows my mind. Um, I couldn't even hold it at first. So maybe he was worried. But, you know, the thing that made me want to rock was Elvis Presley. And uh, by the time I was eight, I had an Elvis set. And it was Teddy Bear and Blue Suede Shoes. Wow. And I would sing and play. And my we were at this big fat Greek wedding. There's maybe 400 people there. And my dad's like, hey, why don't you get up and do your Elvis stuff? And I'm like, are you crazy? There's like hundreds of people here. And he's like, yeah, but you got it. You could do it. And then he talked to the band that was having dinner. And he said, my son's going to get up and play some songs. And they're like, wait, what? And then before we knew it, I had a guitar on. I was singing into the guy's microphone. And... This is way before YouTube too, so it's not like you could look up eight-year-old singing and playing at a wedding. So it was like everybody that was there was, "Who's this kid? This is incredible! This is amazing!" So that's when I realized that I really wanted to uh, do it as a as a as a thing as for the rest of my life. 
And then it, it went on from there. You know, I had one friend, that one cousin that introduced me to Ted Nugent when I was 11. So I got into that. Yeah! <laughs> and then when Bitman, it was like, and it's funny now because I'm friends with Derek St. Holmes. And oh, uh, I lo we love Derek. Yeah. Derek's amazing, man. And he's still got it. He still has that voice. And when you get I, on stage I, I, with Derek and you play Stranglehold or just what the doctor ordered, like we played and we jammed in the, the Hired Gun documentary, um, you, feel, you feel 11 again. Because there's that voice from Double Live Gonzo. Holy shit. Yeah. Oh my God. That was the first time I heard the word pussy. <laughs> Come on. You got yeah, but Bobby, in your case, when it came to that, it was still in one ear and out the other. Yeah, See? well, I thought it was a cat. <laughs> that, that's the whole thing. And then, and then obviously, when I turned 14, um, the magic of Eddie Van Halen was put into my ears, and then that was it. Like, but I feel like. My approach, even then, even as a teenager, witnessing the King, like in 1980, 81, 83, 84, I saw all those shows with Roth at Maple Leaf Gardens. Changed yeah. my life. But I knew there was an Eddie, and the world didn't need another Eddie, and there would never be another Eddie anyways. But even at a young age, I go, okay, what did he do? He invented the look, a new look for a guitar. He invented licks of his own. He had his own style. He had fire. He, he locked in with the drummer. His timing was amazing, all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, so that's your checklist. But not his licks, not his look of the guitar. Not, you know, it's so just something. I'm going inter to interrupt you right now. And, and you have this that ed has and it's been brought out the great thing about eddie van halen one thing eddie has always done was smile and dude every time i fucking seen you on stage and there well, are guitar th this makes a guitarist and somebody you enjoy seeing zach wild yourself when you smile and this and that uh, have you ever seen look i don't need a shoegazer but you, Zach, Ed, there are so many. Nuno, new, yeah, there are these people that I love watching play who do that. And when I see that smile on your face, I'm going, dude, you're loving what you fucking yeah. do. Yeah. I think what it, we exude is the joy that we have. And you got to give it to Wolfie doing what he's doing now. And I see... I'm glad he's not doing his dad, but I see his dad in him with his right. smile on stage. Yeah. Absolutely. And kudos that he's up for a fucking Grammy, too. I love Isn't that. Isn't that amazing? I think that's amazing. Yeah. I love his voice. Yes. I hear him sing, I'm like, wow, oh. this is insane, man. Yeah. But 100. what a great album from the heart. But, dude, you know, nothing to take away from you. And look, nobody wants you. Richie did the same thing too, and I think that's why John loved having him in the band. When you look yeah. at look, I'm if you go back at the In and Out of Love video at Seaside Heights, my fucking long hair, eighty ass is right there when they were playing on the bathroom. <laughs> Come on, yeah, I'm in the I'm in the video, dude. I'm not you, gonna go. You never it. told us this. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm um, I'm in Yep, it's right near the sausage stand when they were doing in and out of love on the they shot it like eight times. But that was the coolest thing. And it was like MMR was like, oh, come down and do that. Get out. Yeah, it was the whole thing when Bon Jovi was really the fire was coming. But that was the whole thing. There were guitar players. Um Come on, you know, I grew up in Philly, Cinderella, Britney Fox. If you had that swag, you know, Vito had it too. And it's a shame yeah. the fire went out of Vito Brada. But, yeah. dude, the smiles and the energy, but Eddie kept it all the way to the end. Absolutely. And I, like you said, there would be nobody that's like Ed. No, never. So keep doing, keep doing what you're Thanks, doing, man. and I I don't care its ability. If you can make an audience love who you are and enjoy being, Chris Caffrey does it. There are people who connect with the that connects more with the audience than your ability. I think it's contagious. I think when you see it on stage, you just want to. 
And that's what I got from Ed. That's what I got from Cheap Trick when I was 14. That's what I got from oh, Ed. Yeah. It just, Come on. Just Rick rocked. Wilson, how much I mean, do you look at Rick, at Rick and just go, oh, my God. You just, yeah. you know. Every time I hear Rick Nielsen play, I keep thinking Fast Times at Ridgemont High. You know the swagger of you know Rick. <laughs> just... I've, yeah, Bobby. I've always, I've also always, like, you know, similar to Eddie, similar, you know, just like Eddie, just like Phil, just like those guys you named. It's also was something I've always noticed in Hoekster too, is because Joel always looks so happy when that dude's on yeah. stage. Absolutely. Like just that ear to ear grin. So Steve cool. Brown does the same thing. When you yeah. can bring the oh. joy, because you know the audience has spent a lot, but if you're having a great time on stage, share it. Yeah. Um, Night Ranger does it. There, there are bands that I could see thousands of times and I could listen to the songs over and over. But when the energy from the band is like, and I'm leaving there going, that just. Wow, you made me feel like I got every penny worth of my money. And <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Bob, for sure. So, Bobby, let me jump in, brother. I need to do a hard out yeah. on this section because I've been seeing a lot of questions pop up because oh, I can yeah. a lot are coming in for Phil. So, Angel, let's kick it up to you, man. Okay, let me start all the way from the beginning. <laughs> Where the hell I'm All was. the way from the beginning, he says. Oh, boy. <laughs> Don't worry. I got this. I know okay, you do. Top. You know, just everybody say hello. Um, hey, hello. Question people. Greetings from your hometown. Yep, there, there are questions. Okay, here's one. Oh, um, Melissa Styles. Um, she would like to know, will we be seeing anything new from Phil and the Drills soon? Yes. First yeah. of all. Yeah. Yeah, man. First of all, we're uh, we have a bunch of songs in the can. Uh, they're getting mixed, and then we're just uh, getting ready to do. Wait, waiting for the new year to roll in, um, and then we'll put it, be putting out uh, a single with some special promotional uh, marketing features in February. It looks like just, we're going to start then, and then uh, little by little, the record will come out, and then the whole record will come out on vinyl and. Um, we're, we just had a meeting with Golden Robot Records uh, via Zoom a couple of weeks ago, and they have some tricks up their sleeves that I'm really excited about. Nothing I can let out of the bag, but uh, it's pretty exciting. But thanks for asking about the drills, man. That's my passion. Ah, uh, love um, the drill. And we have a question from Sonia de Barros from Brazil. Uh, good night, Phil. Well, it's night. Well, yeah, it's still nighttime in Brazil. I was thinking something else. Uh, we're looking forward to a show with you and your band, The Drills. Is there a chance of this happening, of you coming uh, down to to Brazil? Brazil? Well, I'd love to. We'd all love to. Um, I did get a call from a friend uh, who was talking to a Brazilian and South American agent, so it's a possibility. It's hard to say. Anything's for sure with, uh, you know, being in the, in the, whatever the pandemic is, whatever the status is of this situation, whether it's at the tail end or in the middle, or we'll see what happens. But I would love to. I've been to Brazil with Bon Jovi and had a blast. Uh, I'd love to bring the drills down there for sure. Very cool. So I, I, I just got a text and our friend <laughs> says hello. Don Pinnock! Don Pinnock! Don! <laughs> So all I heard was the solo, and I've heard it a, a long way from home that you did on Dougie's album, right. and the video he did for you guys and the drill, and which we posted, dude. We were, you know, we got to get you. I, look, we love. I got to tell you, I didn't tell you how that song happened. When, uh, it's called "No Woman of Mine," and uh, yes, I knew. I knew I got Abe Laborio Jr. on drums, who's one of my favorite drummers, and the groove is unbelievable. And uh, it's three guys. That track is three guys jamming off the floor. It was me, Abe, and Daniel Spree, the, the bass player from the Drills. He's my left wing for life, and we just we laid that down off the floor. And then I went home, and I knew I wanted to do a duet. And I called Doug and I said, "Hey man, would you sing on this?" And he goes, "Send it to me." And let me hear it. So I kind of send it to him, but then, so I thought, okay, I'll open the song with my voice and my guitar. 
And then when Abe comes in, Doug will come in. So I had him sing the second verse. And when I got home, I was like, I'm singing the first verse, and then he comes in for the second verse, and I say to myself, I do not belong in the same register as Doug Pinnock. <laughs> but with the miracle of uh, you know hard drive recording, and I'm using Pro Tools, I yeah. took his verse and I flew it into the first verse. Ah, really? Wow! And then I went into my plant range for the second verse, and then we do that bridge section in octaves. It, it it sounds like it was planned. That's the one time that plan B was better than plan A. Because his voice and my guitar out of the gate, it's like... And it's the, In the face. Right? And I can't even... I couldn't even imagine hearing it any other way. So... And and he was so cool when he came in. We went, we did his vocal at Dan's studio in Burbank. And Dan's like, hey, you want a drink before you get started? And he's like, uh, sure, what you got? He goes... Uh, Dan's like, I got beer and I got whiskey. And uh, Doug goes, both. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, we're getting we're getting rock and roll rolling here. Oh. That's awesome. Look, I, I I mean, we we've had the we have the greatest relationship with he, Hal Sparks, the guys from Nerd Halen and everything. But Doug, I, I've never met in the Oh gosh, 40 years I've known Doug now through the whole Christian circuit and doing shit with he and Ty and you know, oh, yeah. I, I mean, you can never, uh, there'll never be another King's X. I'm so looking forward to this new album coming out. Oh yeah, I'm excited um, too. Absolutely. But, and there'll be, never be another Doug Pinnock. And we're so glad to have him as part of our family. And for he to be on the drill album, Dude, when he did it in that video, and it's like that voice and yours and your guitar, I'm going, look, you and John, John is like, take your panties off. Doug is like, it's like going to church when you hear Pinnock. Oh, it totally is. He's got so much, so much magic in that voice. It's uh, And it was like, that's what I was talking about. I was like, I can't, I can't put myself in that. Because he's he owns it, so that's why I had to do something completely different. But just I knew it was gonna be great, and it just came out way better than I could ever expect. And I, I love that about music too. You know that track just. And then Chris Lord and Algy mixed it, and he just he put his pixie dust on it. And when I listen to it now, it's like this is one of the best things I've ever recorded. <laughs> Absolutely. And I got, and we got to say, look, you know, and I'm going to throw it back to Angel. But yeah, when you did that, and, and I got to say, do you sit there? Look, you're you're an accomplished musician yourself. But to work with somebody like that, and when you get the magic that happens, does it just like go, what the fuck? What just happened here? You know, it's just like, exactly, really? Because, I mean, the first time I met him, I was at a friend's studio and we were standing in the kitchen and we we're just talking and I was trying not to stumble over my words because I was a huge King's X fan that my cover bands always played over, over my head. So now I'm talking to the dude and I'm like, wow. And then he kind of listens to what I do and likes what I'm doing. And I, I've, I've been, always been a fan of his. So when you put that energy together, when... It's just the next step is, hey, will you sing on my record? Yeah, man. And will you play on my record? And and when that happens and both come out so great, you're just going, this is, how, how does this happen, man? This is nuts. Absolutely. So I'm going to throw this out real quick, Jay, before we go throw it back. So the okay. thing about Doug, when I came out, Doug was the first person I came out to. And that was in 91 from his, th and wow. that was real. We, he and I had a great, look, he could have lost all his shit over everything through King's X. Yeah. The greatest thing that kept Doug being Doug is being authentic. And I told him, I'm like, look, you Halford, there are people that you didn't lose. Um, you knew who you were but you didn't let it define you of that. And that was the greatest thing because it didn't segregate people like yourself to go, well, I'm not playing with this guy. You know, I don't want to be in that category. 
And yeah. the greatest thing is, is look, and, and Jay and all of us, look, I want to be 71 and be that fucking cool. Right. I think we all <laughs> want to be 71 and be that cool. You know, so totally. that's where I'm going to go. Back to you, brother. No, absolutely. Angel, let's kick it right back to you, my man. Susan, thank you for being patient. We got you covered. Yeah, we got you covered. I was just going to take a small pause um, just to fulfill a request for a five-year-old. Sure. Um, Anna, um, she says, I don't know how many five-year-old fans do you have, but can you say hello to Max? Max? Yeah, her five-year-old. Um, hey, son, hey Max. Max. My daughter's five, and yeah. she's not even a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I, I come downstairs and she goes, sometimes she says, hi, daddy. And sometimes she says, hi, Phil X. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? Anyways, Max, hey, Max. Max, Max is the five-year-old? Yeah, Max is the five-year-old. Hey, Max, how you doing, buddy? I hope you're rocking. And I hope you had an amazing Christmas. And I uh, hope you have an awesome 2022. And you also have fans that are dogs, um, Melissa and her dog Chloe are watching, and they wonder if you could say hello. Hey Chloe! Oh my God! Hey, Chloe. <laughs> what we have? I mean, I mean, Steve, oh your dog God. comes on the show sometimes. True. I have a dog because, named Daryl, by the way. An, yeah. an angel's cat, and whatever. Yeah. I don't have a cat. Jay's, Jay's, Jay's cat. <laughs> I'm oh, like, Jay's huh? Got a cat. That's right. <laughs> oh, I got to drink more. I got to keep drinking more. I'm at Disney. What the hell? Everybody's got yes. a cat. Jay is <laughs> the one with the cat. <laughs> I, I'm, I always try to be surrounded by it. Angel. Um, okay, it Susan. All right. Susan is going to kill me. Luckily, she's in Toronto. Okay. Uh, she wants to know um, what high school did you go to in actually uh, both high schools were in um, Sasaga so uh, hmm. I went to uh, Woodlands and then I went to Clarkson secondary and uh, yeah and you know you know anybody I'm looking for her answer <laughs> uh, okay Rachel hi Rachel uh, what's the significance of one 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 on your Instagram handle. Um, uh, for years, I would do the eleven eleven thing. I would I see eleven eleven on on a on a clock, and I would make a wish. Wow! And uh, so that's what it is. It's Phil X eleven eleven. Nice. Because <laughs> I made some wishes that came true, man. Hell yeah. Whoa. Maybe like playing stadiums. <laughs> <laughs> it's my girl Rachel. She's the best. Thank you so much for supporting, girl. You rock. Okay. Um, answered that one already. <laughs> it's just like a lot of people posting. Oh, hello. Yeah, there's one, hello. Another question from Melissa. Okay. Uh, what are your favorite features about Gibson and your favorite about Framus? Well, the, the funny thing is about, I, I've always loved the SG and because I love the access to the higher frets and I love the weight and it has to be a thicker neck SG. So when I went to Gibson in 2020, I played a couple of 64 custom shop SGs and I'm like, this neck rocks. And it's really balanced. And I put my pickup in it, and uh, it just screamed. It's like a perfect drills guitar. Um, the Framus thing was trying to get them to make an SG. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I liked about the Framus is that they made me a, a cool SG. But um, it just made sense to go to the OG SG company, which is Gibson. So that's why that happened. Nice. Uh, question from Nina. She wants to know what is your favorite Bon Jovi album? Uh, you're, Nina Todorinis. Um, um, I suck with names. That's why I just try not to ruin it. Yeah, that's I'll, I'll get killed. <laughs> um, the, uh, my favorite. I just suck. I, I think it's a. There are songs on, on Slippery When Wet and songs on New Jersey that just, you know. I think one, at one one there'll be a phase where it'll be slippery when wet, and then it'll be another phase when it'll be uh, uh, New Jersey. Nice. It's, the, it's the classics, man. 
Now, this would put some of us to shame. Uh, almost 4 a.m. here from from a fan that's watching. I guess in Europe, it's got to be 4 a.m. Yeah, she's somewhere in Italy. In Europe, yeah. Italy yeah. 4 a.m. Yes. Man, that's, living, that's truly living after midnight right there. <laughs> it just makes us feel special that thank you so much for supporting and watching yeah. and supporting Phil and checking out the show. Thank especially you. Yeah. At, especially at 4 a.m. Yes, absolutely. Some of us have got to go to work tomorrow. We're not selling out arenas. Hey, <laughs> oh, so it's it's still a weekday, right? Is it a day day? Day? What, what about touching butt based on a little bit of frozen ghost? Wow. Um, that was my first, uh, <laughs> my first experience of touring. Um, but that was also my first experience. I was in the studio, Arnold Lanny. I spoke to him last week. We talk all the time. He was the singer, songwriter, producer, and he went on to produce Our Lady Peace and, uh, a whole bunch of bands that sold millions of records. Um, he's, I learned a lot from him, uh, because he's a, a an amazing keyboard player and songwriter. So when he was showing me a song, I'd go, wow, what, what voicing is that chord? Cause you know, I grew up a rock player uh, not knowing what a 13 was. <laughs> so he's, <laughs> he's explaining, he's breaking it down for me. It sounds like this. And I, I get the sound and I go, wow, that's an amazing chord. So I learned a lot from him musically and he became a, one of my best friends. And, uh, but it was the first time that I piled into a bus and did a, you know, a tour of weeks and weeks of just getting on stage every night and playing songs. So I owe a lot to that band for the experience. But it was a. It was and the amazing. other thing I wanted to ask you how did you wind up on the Elton John tribute album, Two Rooms album? See, that's a good question. Um, so at the time, I was touring with Aldo Nova. So that was after Frozen Ghost, oh. singing, doing Life is Just a Fantasy every night promoting a record that was on John Bon Jovi's record label, Jamco Records. Yep. And John had co-written the songs with Aldo and he also co-produced it with Aldo. So we went out there. So when we were rehearsing to do the tour, we learned Blaze of Glory. So John could come on stage with us and we could do his current hit, which was Blaze of Glory. And we could also play, he would sing Blood on the Bricks, which was our single with us. And then, uh, and then, it was after the whole New Jersey touring and stuff like that. And John did blaze of glory and he didn't have, you know, the band was taking a hiatus. So he called Aldo and said, Hey, can you come to the house for a couple of days? I want to record leave on for this Elton John, Bernie Topin tribute record and have your guys. I'll just use your band. And, uh, what it was really weird how it went down though. Cause Aldo, um, he tried to turn it into, um, chariots of fire with loops and stuff. And John said, that's not, <laughs> I'm, that's not what I'm going for. And then Aldo was like, well, then I'm going home. So he went home and John looked at me and said, well, we lost, we lost Aldo. So I guess you're playing all the guitars. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. I'm going right, to go. Jay, back to you. Yeah, I got yeah. It. Well, I'm going to go to two more fan questions yeah, and then yeah, my question yeah. as well. Absolutely. No worries, Bobby. It's all good. Angel, rock it out, my man. Uh, Susan wants to know um, any chance of you coming to play in Toronto with your band? Oh. Um, we'll see. Usually I make, uh, I make time. Um, again, this was before the pandemic. There would be something happening where I'd go up to play at a, a rock camp on the lake north of Toronto, and then I'd throw in a gig uh, or just be in Toronto visiting my mom or something and go, hey, let's, let's do a show. So uh, it's everything changed when, the, when COVID hit. So I'm not sure anything's in the books right now, but you never know. Okay. And kind of going back to Anna, um, she's the one that we said hi to her five-year-old son, Max. Um, oh, my God, he's jumping. Thank you so much, Phil. He just started his guitar lessons a few months ago because of you. So thank you. Wow. You go, Max. Go. Any, any cool advice that you would give to, to Max, uh, being that um, you know, picking up a, a guitar? Uh, wow. It's, yeah. it's, there's no shortcuts. I know you're five and don't understand shortcuts really, but everything, <laughs> everything, everything just takes lots of practice. 
kids and, and patience. So I know even my son, he picks up a guitar sometimes and I'm like, okay, now take this and move it to here. And he, and, okay, you gotta press a little harder. Okay, press a little harder. And then he's like, that's it. I'm just gonna play the microphone. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay. You know, it's just, it takes a lot of patience and a lot of uh, practice. So, Max, just be patient and just press harder. And always go back to this episode. If you ever need to hear that advice again, always go back to this episode when you're older, like in five years. Yeah, man. This is valuable information. (laughs) Hey, Phil, so I got to, let me jump in real quick. So, you worked with an artist who, um, I studied with a guy named David Ivory who brought and produced this band from the Philly area, Lizzie Hale. How the hell did you wind up on Hailstorm's album? Dude, uh, I love that band. I think Lizzie is one of the best singers in rock and roll today. And well, we're going to have her on very soon. Tell her I see him. I saw her at NAMM 2020 because they we, we were they she sang okay, so it was the the, the slash party at the Gibson party. I mean, it was yeah, a slash was performance at the Gibson party, and I ran into um, Lizzie backstage, and uh, it had it had been wild because I, I played on their first record, maybe second record, I forget, but uh, and she got on stage and she for me being a fan i think she stole the night she her she just sang like it was the last performance of her life and i was looking around i was reading the room and the room is like if they knew her they knew it was happening and if they didn't know who she was they were like who the fuck is that so if she has that impact right so i i just uh it was funny though too i'm so happy for that band because when i played on their first record it was Howard Benson that brought me in. We worked together on uh, some Daughtry and Kelly Clarkson and Chris Cornell, and and uh, he was doing that that Hillstorm record. And I came in and he goes, "Hey, we need some magic guitar." And I did so I I did what was requested of me, and uh, and then there, I go, "I gotta skip out early today because my band's playing at the Cat Club." And then. I go on stage with the drills at the Cat Club, the dive that used to, used to be on Sunset that is now a pub, and I see Hailstorm standing in front of the stage. I had to dip out of their session to go play at the Cat Club, and they came to the Cat Club to see my band. <laughs> and they were, they to you, man. They're like, we had to come and see you play, and it was awesome. <laughs> That's so that was cool. that was. That was that relationship uh, started and then uh, they went on to become this incredible force and won a Grammy and it's just what a what a what a career that band is having I think it's so amazing and I'm so happy for them so, so I got I gotta tell you the whole story so David Ivory found her her and her brother were trying to do a Christian rock band up in her Harrisburg Pennsylvania it was the Millennial Music Fest. David Ivory, who produced, you know, Silver Tide and worked with Erica Badu, and you know, Dave and I are great friends. And he goes, "Yeah, Lizzie wanted to be a Christian artist." And he goes, "No." <laughs> <laughs> you know, her and her brother AJ, and he was like going, and now you listen to, you know, Lizzie, and it's going, she'll kick your ass. Totally. You know, I talk. I talked to JC at Gibson. And I, I mean, I, I mean, JC's like, and Mark are like, and L John are like, no. You know, I'm like, yeah. Could you picture see her singing "Jesus loves me"? This time, now it's like, bitch, I'll rip your ass out. You know. <laughs> Dude, but you know what is really amazing about her is she's empowering so many young women uh, to to speak and and uh rock and play guitar and sing and write music and she's just she's a force she's the new wonder woman (laughs) well we've been we've been very fortunate with bands like plush uh she 
Amy Lee, we're, I'm tr working on the guys. We're trying to get Amy Lee from Evanescence, and I, yeah. I do a couple things with her. Uh, the great thing is a lot of us are very supportive of people with disabilities. Amy lost her brother to a SUDEP from seizure disorder. My partner headed up the Epilepsy Foundation. But uh, it, it's just been a, women like she and uh, Amy Lee and, uh, you know, Plush and people like that. I love that we have women out there. Joan Jett, look, I love that Joan's still kicking ass. She's still kicking ass. Unbelievable. No. Absolutely, but thank sure. you for doing everything you're doing. Jay, back to you, brother. Totally, man. Angel, let's keep it with you to get through the last questions. And of course, a question from yourself, because then I want to bring back in Steve. Okay. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, you played on, well, you co-wrote and played on the Proof of Life song with Scott Stapp. Yes. Um, it's like a track that I listened to it, and I don't know how many guitars you played on that track. Did you play one or two? Because it, it's like one of those songs that if you hear it, you kind of hear like a lot of different stuff going on in that song, guitar-wise. That song is an interesting, um, has an interesting story because we, we recorded that demo at Tyler Connolly's house from Theory of a Dead Man. And uh, we got it sounding great. And... I had, it got submitted for the Scott Stapp record and then it made the record and I had recorded six songs on that record before, right before we were supposed to record Proof of Life, the song, I got the call. Hey, we need you in Calgary tonight. And it was, you know, Bon Jovi uh, <laughs> calling me away from the Scott Stapp record. So... <laughs> Um, I didn't get to play on that song, but I do hear a lot. It was Tim Pierce, who is an amazing guitar player. I love his playing. I love him as a person. And he got called in to finish the record. And I, I heard a lot of what's so funny. <laughs> it was a lot of, uh, I hear a lot of what I did on the demo uh, interpreted by Tim Pierce. So I can't really answer your question. Okay. But it, it, it no, does a lot, a lot like the demo. It does. No, because I saw your name. Whatever happened to like... Scott? He's touring, man. What do you mean? Yeah, he's touring solo now. Yeah. Oh, is he? Oh, yeah, yeah he is. For sure. 100%. Bobby, get down from the roof when the show's over. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, look, is he on the road with Nickelback? What? No, no. <laughs> oh, he's, uh, he's, he's actually, it's funny because I, I just did uh, a bunch of dates with a, an artist. His name is Kurt Dimer. And uh, we did like 45 shows opening for Jeff Tate from September to November. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, Steve's brother. and the sound guy is Scott Stapp's sound guy. And he also, wow. I had to, I had to like, uh, relieve our first drummer of his duties during the first leg and our sound guy kyle brought on dango scott Stapp's drummer to finish the the tour so scott Stapp's drummer became our drummer and his sound guy is our sound guy cool. so and he's he's really he's doing the jigsaw puzzle for the next year like who's, who's <laughs> work for it. and it's uh it's we had a great time man it was a uh, if you guys, you guys should check it out. We did a really cool cover of uh, "Have a Cigar." And, I've heard, uh, I've heard it. It's ah. really good. Oh, thanks, man. I thought it was cool. I man. love your version of "Highway to Hell" that you guys did. Oh man, hey, ACDC oh, baby! Oh, oh, god, yeah, absolutely. Who did we just have yeah. on. We had uh, ACDC's uh, producer on who did the last album. Yep, we we had uh, Mike Frazier on. Mike. Mike, wow. Yeah. What yeah, what a what a badass. Somebody Absolutely. you need to work with. I know, right? I gotta definitely. Steve, let's bring you in, my good man. So okay, so you brought up SG. So last year, one of our very first guests that we had on was Mr. Steve Lukather. Wow. Okay. Love, yeah. love uh, Steve, his ex girlfriend is one of my dearest friends, Amber Thayer, Tommy's ex wife. Okay. So my fiance is a costume designer for Broadway, off Broadway and whatnot. Uh, she made masks for Amber and Steve. And he uh, emailed out to them. And I 
was taking a nap for some reason or whatever. And I get a call. I didn't recognize the number, so I didn't answer. It was a California number. He leaves me a message and everything. He's like, dude, thank you so much for you and your lady for making up these masks. Everything, I really appreciate it. If there's anything I could do, let me know. So I call back and everything. I'm like, well, come to think of it, would you come on our show? He's like, sure. And then I started talking because you talked about your children. I'm a proud papa of two. I'm happily divorced. I have two kids. I have a 12-year-old that's going on 40 and wow. a nine-year-old that's going on 20. Two boys. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So I, he plays – my oldest son plays recorder. And he goes um, – I was like, Jack, do you want to learn how to play another instrument? He said, yeah, Dad. He's like, I'm not going to get any ass learning how to play a recorder. I'm like – Okay, so what do you want? <laughs> he said that. Yes. Okay. Wow. So, and he's also been a co-host of the show. He interviewed with us, Joey Allen, the cars of Warren. Wow. Yeah. So, and he's very profound about what he said. And I was like, okay, so what instrument do you want to learn? He's like, guitar. I'm like, okay. So I'm talking to Steve about this. He's like, oh, call my Gibson rep. So I call his Gibson rep, and they sent my oldest son uh, an SG. Wow, he has an SG now. So nice. he picked it up a couple of times. He he's more into cooking and Japanese anime. That's his thing. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, twelve years old. So then, um, two years ago, Kiss was playing in Philly. So I took both my sons because my first Kiss concert was Eric Carr's first show ever. Wow. Okay, July twenty fifth, nineteen eighty. My dad took me. So I thought it'd be great for my kids to see Kiss, everything. And of course we go backstage and I run into Doc McGee. So, and I'm like, hey, Uncle Doc, how are you? Uh, this is my kids, this is the little monsters. This is Jack and Charlie. And he goes, nice to meet you. And he's like, wait a minute, Jack, I met you when you were a year old in North Carolina. He's like, yes, you did. And he goes, I have a question for you. And I'm like, Jack, you know, Doc manages um, Bon Jovi at one time, Kiss. Yeah. Skid Row, you know, and, and Motley Crue. And then he goes, Mr. McGee, can I ask you a question? He's like, sure. He's like, who do you think's a better guitarist, Bill X or Richie Sambora? Holy shit. Goes, that's a very profound <laughs> question. He's like, that's very difficult. Who do you think? He goes, well, see, I think Bill's playing is better, but Richie sings better. This is a 10-year-old kid. That's <laughs> Yeah, so I had to share yeah, that. That's, that's not my favorite story of the week for sure. Holy <laughs> shit. So that's my question funny. is, what was your first concert? So, oh, you're asking yeah. me? My first, yes, sir. Um, cheap Trick. Cool. And that really? Was that was amazing. That was... Uh, what year? It was, uh, wait, 19... Uh, might have been 79 or 80. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So was that uh right when they were doing wow, that must have been the heavy metal I think Budokan, I think, they were I think Budokan just came out. So that Budokan. was 78, 78. Yeah, so okay, so Budokan was out. It was but it was before Dream Police. Yeah. So it was between Budokan and Dream Police and uh Graham Parker and the news opened up. No. Wow, Green Parker and the and the what? Green Parker and the because it's Huey Lewis in the news. Green Parker and the help me out, somebody. No, okay. Ah! Green Parker opened up. <laughs> so to piggyback on that question and everything, playing guitar. Um, you said your dad played as well, but do you play any other instruments? Besides um, not really. I mean, I, I, I sometimes people come to me when I'm doing remote sessions and they go, we need guitars and bass on this. And I'll do all the guitars and bass. But that's another stringed instrument. You know, it's not, it doesn't really count. Um, actually, bass Yeah, but you can't bass. play, good, look, you can't play bass like a guitar. Look, I got my ass kicked on that shit. No, man, I, I, I play with my fingers. I, I record yeah. bass right, and I'm so melodic. <laughs> and then... Look, but, uh, my whole know, thing is, is, and you can't play like a white guy. I'm no, from you can't play like I, a white I played guy. with I played with these black guys, and they're like looking at me, going, "Dude, you clap on the one and three. <laughs> you know, <laughs> stop." I I feel like uh, I could uh, you know because of 
recording formats and stuff like that, you could play a little bit of keyboards and make yourself sound really good because you could, of all the quantizing and uh, MIDI and stuff like that. Um, I love drums, but I suck. So yeah, no, I don't really play anything else. I play bazooki still a little bit. It kind of takes me back to my dad, who I lost in 2005. <laughs> and it kind of it hurts a little bit, but uh, it's a beautiful instrument. Awesome. And then uh, Philip uh, Petrona said it was Graham Parker and the Rumor. Thank you, Philip, in uh, Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Very cool. Right on. So, Phil, I wanted to touch base with you on uh, an album that you played some guitar on for an artist that I truly love, that being Rob Zombie. And oh, yeah. you played him on the Sinister <laughs> Urge album. So it's kind of a this is kind of a two part thing. The first part is talk about, you know, playing, you know, working with Rob and recording on the Sinister Urge. And second of all, I'm just curious more for myself, but I think it would be a cool possibility possible story for the fans is it wasn't long after that because the Sinister Urge was then followed up by Educated Horses. And the Rob Zombie band went from Riggs to John Five. Yeah. So talk a little bit about no, 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 recording. No, 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 but but, uh, did you talk to Rob so about I, I joining the band at any no point when Bonjour Riggs had departed? Um, no, we, uh, it's, it's kind of funny though, because we, uh, okay. So I was, I started on Methods of Mayhem in 99, mm -hmm. which was Tommy Lee's first solo record yep. with Scott Humphrey. So Scott Humphrey did, he produced Hellbilly Deluxe. So in the books down the road was Rob Zombie's, follow-up record so while i was working on um uh while i was working on tommy lee's thing rob would show up and hey hey have meetings with scott and they would talk about songs and he'd bring up uh, song ideas and stuff and then he came up to me and he said hey uh i really like what you're doing on tommy's record i love you to play on my next record and i'm like yeah dude i'm totally in i'm, I'm a fan awesome and then, uh, and then when he, we were working on that, he came in and said, um, hey. did Alice call you yet? Hello. And I'm like, Alice who? And he said, uh, Alice Cooper, I gave him a number last week. So that led to me playing on Brutal Planet. Yeah. But a little more on Sinister Urge. We did that. And then we did, uh, and then we did the soundtrack for, uh, House of a Thousand Corpses. Mm -hmm. And, and then he called me out of the blue and said, hey, I don't have a band right now, but I'm supposed to play on Jay Leno with uh, um, Lionel Richie. And we're, we're going to play uh, Brick House to promote the House of a Thousand Corpses. Right, because he, he did like, that with like Trina and... Yeah, exactly. So he called me and he said, hey, I don't have a band. So can you, do you mind playing guitar for that? And there's a catch. And I'm like... What's the catch? He goes, well, you got to be wearing like zombie makeup. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's not a catch. That's awesome. So, yeah, I love to do it. And it was, I remember it was Chris Chaney on bass and uh, Josh Freeze on drums. So it was killer band. And then they brought in some, a horn section, a zombie horn, horn section. And then him, Trini, and, and Richie Lionel did their thing. So that was an amazing, that was an amazing time. But um, be between that and the, uh, and the, uh, and the horse thing, we we didn't really talk about, you know, me being in the band or anything like that. But I just moved on and moved on, and, and before I knew it, I was playing on more and more records, and the the studio thing came together. I, I didn't at the time feel like doing a band thing that wasn't mine or going on the road kind of thing. So, but but Ron was, it was awesome. It was awesome that I got to do all that stuff. And uh, and he was such a, I, you know, and there was another thing too because it was all bam, 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 bam with the Sinister Urge and the Mission Impossible Three soundtrack. Soundtrack, and, yeah. And then and then the the, the tribute to the Ramones record. Yeah. Where, where he, I was in, we were I was in, just in the studio and he came in and we got Josh to lay down some drums and there wasn't even a bass player, so I ended up playing uh, guitar and bass on uh, the Ramon song. Um, you were playing Blitz, you were playing Blitzkrieg Bop. Bop. And then I remember being in the, the vocal booth with Rob and Scott and we're doing the hey-hos, let go, let's go. 
and I'm listening to Rob. I take my ear off and I listen to Rob and I'm like, holy fuck, he sounds like Rob. <laughs> but it is Rob. He sounds just like he does on records. Just it just comes out of his face. So yeah. I, was, I was I was totally this is amazing. So I ended up doing that, and then when it was time to do a solo, I ended up doing a doing a couple of takes, and I was watching Rob to see if I, you know to get a response, right? So I'm laying down solo after solo, and then when I solo in the studio, it's like I'm on stage. I put on a show, and it's not like to put on the show. It's just how I play, right? So yeah. I'm doing my thing, and I'm doing my thing, and I look at Rob, and I go, "What do you think?" And he goes. I don't know, man. I'm I'm exhausted just watching you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was all that stuff happened in that one period of time with Rob Zombie. It was just really, really great. Really that's, great. That's awesome. That's super yeah. cool. And another question that I thought I wanted to ask you that I thought would be kind of interesting is so, you know, three years ago, 2018, I believe it was, uh, Bon Jovi was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yes. Um, were you present for their induction? Like, were you there? I was there because it was we we all played. Right. Yeah. So um, it was the seven piece band that was in the middle of a tour, and then uh, we did a couple of rehearsals with Richie, so he could come on stage and we could. So then there was eight, and then Alec joined us yeah. at, at the sound yeah. show for, in Cleveland. So it was the seven piece live band plus Richie and Alec which was uh, a nine piece band that played the rock and roll hall of fame. And it was interesting because at the time, you know, it was, it was, I was really excited because I had never met Richie before. So that was kind of a cool thing. But also I was doing press. I'm like, you know, we were in Pennsylvania. Um, Pierre. Was right there from, yeah, MMR. Yeah. Yeah, woo! So he goes, hey, I'm gonna set, we're gonna be setting up in the foyer of the arena. Can you come and do an interview? And I'm like, yeah, sure, man, I'll come in. So I was on. It was one of those times when you do an interview where you feel like, wow, I I can back every answer a hundred percent. That was a good interview. And the funny thing was, is because I got Pierre laughing so hard because he goes, dude, you just played Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with Bon Jovi. What was it like on that stage? And I just said, crowded. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it was nine of us, you know? Yeah. Right. I'm looking over, I got Alec over here, and then John, and then Richie, and then Shanks, and then uh, uh, Tico over here, and you got Everett over there. It was a, a big band, like Chicago or something. But anyways, um, it was just uh, it was a, a lot of fun. It was really interesting to be a part of that. You know, sit at the table. I took my mom. Nice. So that was really cool. I'm gonna go. Phil, I got I got to address the elephant in the room. Did you feel like the second girlfriend who was you know in the room got? Oh, I dated that guy, and now you're the new one. Come on, dude. Wait, you know what? Did you're not in there. You're you're not the only one to put that twist on that because there was a no, there was a you know, time. Look, we've all and you and I are the same age and we you know grew up. But you know, look, we've been there going awkward. And, uh, hi, it, Richie. It was kind <laughs> of interesting. It definitely it's like, was. It's like banging your best friend's girlfriend. I guess. Uh, I could, I, mean, I could have been like, a, oh. at first, maybe I was a rebound. And yeah, then... Or something like that. But you know what it's like? It's like, oh, do you like me better? Am I? <laughs> well, but you know what I'm saying? Well, I had yeah, to bring I, it up. I, I, uh, there's so much to say, but nothing to say. <laughs> I, 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 you know. Look, I, I, got, I, got, I got a no comment clause in my uh, comment. But I brought it up to Kulik, and, and there's been a lot of things on that, and I'm going, look. And, and and Bruce said it best to me. He goes, look, they wouldn't have brought me in if my talents wouldn't have held. And that's why I said it to you. Look, you weren't a comparison. If they didn't trust your ability and your smile... They wouldn't have brought, if you were a dick, they wouldn't have no, brought yeah, you in. That would have been somebody else. Yeah. I mean, that that's, that's, that's the, what I was talking about, bringing your A game to the, the right place at the right time. 
So, so but I was just asking from your opinion, your personal thing. We've all been there where we're like, look, I brought chicks or dudes or whatever do a thing where I'm going. And you know you walk in, you see the other person there, and you go, fuck. Hey, 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 hold on a second. Hey, Bobby, let me interject real quick, bud. When you're asking your questions, lower your tone just a little bit. It's making your mic really scratchy in your statements, buddy. Oh, okay. Perfect. <laughs> totally cool. But also I on that same wiggle my ears. It's okay, dude. But also at that same time, because um, I'll let you finish with your answer to Bobby, because Phil, that's very similar to my follow-up question to that was because we're all well aware of kind of the, the chaos and catastrophe that KISS was when they were going into. So I was curious about your opinion of when they were, you know, of when Bon Jovi wasn't inducted and having former and current members there. You know, how do you remember that whole situation? Did you find it from your point of view to be very cordial? Yeah, I really thought it was really well done. You know, I feel like, you know, um, aside from me, for instance, Hugh McDonald, who's been the bass yeah. player since 2004, I think. And um, he'd been there so long. It just seemed like the right thing, you know, because Rock Hall of Fame has really weird guidelines and very weird mm -hmm. things that they do. And they only want original members. And John called and said, look, he's been in the band for over 20 years. He's got to he's got to make a speech. He's got to accept an award. He's got to be one of the the OG guys. And uh, he fought for it, which I thought was I really respected. I thought that was amazing. Uh, me, I didn't feel left out or anything. I felt like you know this is this is about the band that created the whole thing, mm -hmm. and the bass player who's been there for 25 years or whatever. I feel like everything went the way it should, and the best part was Howard Stern. Yeah. He's he inducted man, him. You only you guys only yeah. got to look it. This speech was way longer and way funnier and way amazing. And he dug the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for taking so long to get this mega band into the realm. So that, a lot of this stuff was cut out. So he, to me, was, I was sitting at the table going, this is the best induction speech I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> John, That's the right guy. Let's put it that way, for sure. Ab no, absolutely. In, in my opinion, when it comes to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, as far as induction speeches, my two favorite speeches, bar none, have been Howard Stern's for Bon Jovi and Tom Morella's for Kiss. Oh, Thank my you. God, yeah. Tom laid it down. When yeah. it came to his induction of Kiss, I was like, "I it was that that alone was worth the non-performance of Kiss." Just listening to Tom also, Morello going off about it, but it really made me wonder how, like, what they cut again because being aware of the editing situation. Oh, okay, they took that out from uh, Howard's speech and this and that and that. I wonder what they took out of Tom's because Tom's yeah. was amazing. Would it would have been even better with the, you know, oh, hey, we can only have this many, we're only allotted this many minutes. You know, I can only imagine what they took out. You know, Yeah, you're, you're right, Phil. It's almost kind of like when somebody gets long-winded at the Oscars, they start playing the Oscar music. But someone on the keyboard. <laughs> Absolutely. All of a sudden, like somebody's talking, and then all of a sudden, like a guitar solo starts, and that's your cutoff. Yeah. <laughs> Be like, it's like the red light at a comedy show. Like, time to wrap it up. Angel, let's kick it over to you, brother. How, let's get some more fan questions in for Phil. Yes, that was one. You guys, I got I to gotta try this. We got my wife a smoker for, uh, nice. for, for Christmas. Because I know how to fucking cook. That's why. That's right. <laughs> oh, I, 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 wrong <laughs> smoker. I'm like, right. this, is all all yeah. so, uh, this is tri tip, right? Oh, yeah. This is from the smoker. Oh if he God. moans, it just means it's good. Oh my God. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm sorry. You love it? No, it's cool. No, I'm sorry. You're good, bro. Oh, I, I, no, no, I, we're good. Hey, Phil, I love when my partner puts meat in my mouth, too. You know, I'm just saying. <laughs> Is he gay? Yes. Oh, okay, perfect. Got it. <laughs> 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 you speaking, man. That, 
<laughs> what the amazing. Smoke in there, so it tastes better. Let's eat pineapple. I gotta oh. tell Tony to smoke his meat. Oh, thank you so, thank you so much, Mrs. X. Last episode of the year, and that is the best question slash quote of this year from this show. <laughs> yes, have your partner smoke their meat. Smoke it, yeah. They can use my smoker, but they have to bleach it after. Whoa, it's amazing. It's amazing. All right, you guys have a great year. You as well. Thank you so much. A great new year. Hey, Phil, I, I told you we are so not that metal show. <laughs> Angel, right back to you, buddy. Dude, that always happens. Yeah. Like, then it's right to me. I'm the one that's gotta. You gotta pick up the Queen. pieces, brother. Bobby the pieces. Ow! <laughs> Hold on, I, I need a second. <laughs> oh, all right. Can you believe I'm talking like this at Disney? Yes, yes, I can. <laughs> I could. Speaking of which, Mrs. X is, you can't get more Disney than Mrs. Mrs. X, man. Oh, she's a uh, Disney babe. Oh, my God. Dude, I'm, I'm so disney I'm tattooed on. <laughs> For sure. I, I got I Mickey I on my taint. <laughs> I think I would get, I would get banned from Disney. <laughs> you know, surprised Bobby hasn't. <laughs> I see a question from Sylvia. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Bobby, we got to hold off on Disney for right now. It's got to be the fans. Yeah, because okay. Sylvia, Sylvia was... she, uh, I know Sylvia too. Um, Phil, do you think about going back to singing powder songs at the drill show? So powder was my band in, in LA from like 2001 to 2010 and uh we we had some great songs but it was my ex-wife that was the singer so that's what happens the eurythmics <laughs> that's what happens when you get the voice the band breaks up but uh i do a live chat i have an app and i do a live chat and some of the people re request like old powder songs so i'll bust into a powder song on my live chat and uh it's pretty i'm like oh this this would sound pretty good with the drills. <laughs> but, so we'll see. Maybe. I don't have a definite answer for that, but maybe someday. Okay. Uh, Lara Hicks. Uh, hey, Phil, do you like your Frank and G guitar? Um, I know you posted something on YouTube. Uh, yeah. Monday. Frank and G kicks. Yeah. Wow. Oh, my God. That's, fucking Th that's awesome. a cool video about. The making of, right? Yeah, the Jump making of it, yeah. That. So, I mean, I'm surprised. Like, I mean, I got in really good with Gibson, and I love Gibson, and they treat me great. And when I called them and said, hey, is it possible to send a blank SG to these guitar finishers in Canada? And they said, sure, what's the address? I was like, what? I was, I was pretty shocked when they said yes. So the body showed up, and it got routed like a Frankenstrat. Totally yeah. nailing. It was painted up. The I was I was actually surprised how the body uh, adapted to the stripes on the horns. I thought, man, that looks pretty close. Uh, obviously, it's a different scale length, so the pickup routes had to be compressed a little bit, come in a little for the to compensate for the the shorter scale length of a of an SG. But man, and it sounded great when I got it. But I thought. A, a wraparound bridge would take it to another level, and it totally did. And I, do you guys want to see it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that, oh, I'm getting God. moist. Oh, oh. Uh, so this, on. this uh, is see that. Hold on, why and This is a Gibson. Yeah. SG. Done That's like so cool. Yeah. Oh my God. So Scott Bodden and and John Burgess. Up in Canada, they routed it like they routed it. Yeah, it. it's got the 1971 quarter. It's got the 80s reflectors on the back. Yeah, wow, nice. And uh, it plays and sounds amazing. Um, I, I couldn't have expected. Now, Phil, can tools. you use your? Can you use your single coil? Um, I I, I put in a humbucker because that. To stay true to the. Well, I know, but a lot of people have been tapping their. Uh, and my buddy, it, uh, 
down here in Florida who owns Mean Street Guitars has been taking a, a single coil and it's a pull up on the volume knob, which allows you to use my front right. pickup. But yeah. check this out, man. I'm a firm believer that the magnet in a neck pickup, even when the neck pickup isn't engaged, pulls on the strings, interrupting the full vibration from the nut to the bridge pickup. So got technical there. <laughs> well, I got to tell Tony that too. Tony, look, yeah. the magnet yeah, pulled on my nuts. So if there's a magnet on here, it's going to pull on your nuts. If there's a magnet here, it's going to pull on the strings and not give you a true vibration to this pickup. Um, so I said the same thing twice. But basically, um, that's pretty exciting. That's pretty exciting. That's why I like one pickup. I, you know, I was, when I was doing the Frederick Americana videos and I played 500 vintage guitars, it, to me it was the juniors that had this mojo. Not only because of the P90, but because it's just one pickup. So I got a real quick question from John Wolfert, who is at Gibson. Good friend of mine who builds John is, he and L. John want to know, uh, what is that guitar that, you know, gives you wood? It's a... Uh... It's, what um, would be that guitar that in your hand would be like, oh, oh, oh you know? No, that's that. that's easy because it, it, it is the SG. It was the first 64 custom shop SG that I got in Cherry. And I, it, they call it Cherry, but to me it looks like a delicious apple. Yes. Um, <laughs> delicious. And uh, it's literally with – I put my Arcane PX100 in the bridge position and, yeah. and Robin – and in the neck position. Hold on. Let's get this one out. <laughs> yeah. I like, see, you didn't think we would go with how good do you know your wood? With, and I don't even have a guitar. Oh, trust me. I'm about to get down on this too. So wait. So right now it's Batman. Oh. Love that color. Right wow. Now it's color, not Jack. Well, it's just Is the one. Your, PX1 really volume, volume and tone. And this, this guitar does... Like if I okay, so if I'm going on the road with Bon Jovi, you have like 20 guitars because there's three different tunings and back backup tunings and the 12 string for one dead or alive and the six string for something else. But with the mm -hmm. drills, I do it all with one guitar with one pickup and it's rock and roll. And that's this oh, guitar. Wait, for wait. Me. Jay's bringing something up. So um, I was with Earl Slick. And, and Slicky is the same way. I have Slicky's last guitar he did with Bowie that Gibson made, which is a double cut. And if you look on the Stay video with David, his uh, gold top with a chocolate back I have. Mark wants it. They want to put an Earl Slick model out. Dude, I'm telling you, you put this in your hand, you'll be like, uh, oh, yeah, it, it'll make you spank. Wow. See? It's always there's always one machine that that you in your hands you just feel like it accomplishes everything you wanted to accomplish when you get on stage. And here's yeah. the funny thing. So Earl, he and I traded. I had a 72. He was getting ready to go out to do uh David's tour. And he goes, I want your 72 telly. And he goes, I'll trade you my guitar, but you can't sell it. And I'm like sitting there going. And when David passed, I got it right before David passed. And I was just wow. like, fuck. Mm -hmm. you know, wow. but, it, it's, but you know what it is. It's, look, it, I don't care what guitar it is. Dude, you sound like you want anything. Ed could play a fucking cardboard box. And totally. Like Ed. Exactly. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Jay, back up to you, man. Yeah, totally. Angel, do me a favor. Make me the big box right quick. We're going to yep. have some more Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to do that right now. I was so, just... I just got my hands on this guy. What? what? That is shiny. Toy. That's my newest toy that I just picked up the other day. Ermin. That's oh. shiny. Where are, they, where are they out of? It's No, it's Keith's. Oh, it's Keith's Oh, Urban. Keith's Urban. Yeah. The Urban. Oh, no. Wow. Wow. Well, yeah. Damn. So this is one wow, of Keith's. Wow, it's his company? Yeah. From it's one of, one of what? 
One One of two? This, this is Keith Urban's signature. Wow. Wow. He put out a series of guitars. He's put out a bunch of series now, but this was from the first series that he ever did, which I liked so much more because the, the next series, they were just lacking like some real bollocks to it. It was like a different style of pickup. The, the, yeah. uh, the, um, it was like they were positioned differently, but I loved the way this one was designed because the pickup goes right oh, up to I'm the good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Which I love. And it's, and it's got a cool pick guard. What, what's uh, the neck profile? Um, the neck profiles, it's, to be honest, it's, it's a, it's about a, it's about a medium thick style. Yeah. Um, like a which C. Is, yeah. Which is, which is cool because like, I don't oh, know if yeah. that's going to, if that's going to help much, but. It does help. But, um, I like it because I tend to, it was funny. You were talking about liking like thicker necks and stuff like that. And I, I'm preferably a bass guy because that's what I like to play, but yeah. I've got somewhat small hands. So like, I like kind of like a smaller neck, but this one has a, also a really nice round, uh, rounded neck to it, which fits right. like a C shape. So, it's, cool. it's so yeah. snug and stuff, but nice. yeah, yeah, this is, this was cool. It was just, yeah, one of his, it's part of his first signature collection Amazing. Uh, before they changed things up and uh, kind of like lowered a little bit of the vibration that you were talking to and the pickups yeah weren't really coming through with quite as much, you know, balls as like, I love that. Crazy. You know what that, that looks what? a lot like the old Pete Townsend. Remember when he had the Schecters? Yep. I do. For sure. Wow. That's what that Jay, that's what that reminds me when he was doing, you know, like the whole, uh, what was it? Uh, the rough boys and his yeah. early, Face to face when he was doing that Schecter series. Yeah, so well, that's just a badass. So who's making those for for uh, Keith? I need to find out who's doing. You know them. how you know how Schecter does the Zach Wild uh, Wild guitars and stuff. Yeah, yeah, the, the Wild audio guitars. I need yeah. to double check on that because this one came into my hands because my. Uh, my guitar guy is Jerry Camuso, who's who's known like, you know, the guys in Hurricane and Quiet Riot and used to work for Virgin Records and like all those guys and stuff like he knew he was really close with Kevin DeBro. Wow. And uh, he you and he actually did. Do you remember the band Snow? Yeah. So Snow was Tony Cavazzo with um with uh with Rudy Sarzo's brother um oh so they I, became hurricane no Snow that's became- no hurricane yeah hurricane is Tony is uh Tony Cavazzo with Robert Sarzo but uh-huh. Tony used to have a band called Snow that actually was with Steven Quadros who most people know as the fight doctor from Pride Ultimate Fighting. Oh my God. That's he was the commentator and he's an, also an actor. There was a, a movie he did called Shock 'em Dead with Tracy Lords, where he basically played a geek who sold his soul to the devil to become a rock like God. To that's like become like the ultimate rock star. And his. Wait, 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 do I want to watch that? You definitely do because his stunt double, as in musician double, was Michelangelo Badio. Oh my God, that's funny! Because he plays the double necks where the necks go out this way. Wow. But um, but yeah, so um, he knew the guys from from Snow, like Carlos Cavazzo, when he did when he did the uh, the band Snow before Quiet Riot, because um, Bang Your Head, Metal Health was a Snow yeah. song that got rewritten into bang your head wow. so yeah so hmm. I, I think a lot of that i think a lot of stuff like that went down in uh in uh in la where yeah hey wait where did that come from hey where did that come from and everybody's like ripping each other off kind of thing well so tony still collects royalties as as yeah. the writer of that song and that's it wasn't the, ripped off the canoe nope, he's, he's still collecting awesome. a, um 
together. Yes, that yes, Carla, they totally did. They sure did. The snow did get together for a reunion. But it was guys, funny. I, I don't I don't know how how long you guys usually go, but I'm I'm going to have to start wrapping it up soon so I can Okay. Yeah. Big, big okay. Oh, absolutely. Well, so hold on a second. So fans, last call for alcohol right now. Get your questions in. We'll do one more spin across. Steve, All the Disney kick- guys just left. <laughs> right. Let me win no alcohol. I got one quick question before we got, we didn't even fucking bring it up. How did you get hooked up with fucking Tommy Lee? You know, the whole methods of mayhem and all that. So I'm going to throw that's my last question right there. That's my true Hollywood story. Cause I was, I was, I had moved here from, uh, from Canada and didn't have, uh, you know, the proper work papers, so to speak. And I was, I was uh, painting Scott Humphrey's garage <laughs> and they were doing, uh, they started Methods of Mayhem. Tommy had all these ideas um, and, uh, and they were doing tracks and he had, he loved, he was loving loops and played some drums and put it all together. And then he said, Hey, we, we need to get a guitar player for this record. And Scott said, let's get Phil. And Tommy's like, the dude painting in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Scott's like, yeah. Uh, and he's like, all right. So I put down the paintbrush, pick up the Les Paul, plug in, play some shit. And Tommy's like, dude, you got to play on this whole record. And then, That's like, fucking awesome. Yeah. And then, but then Scott's like, after you paint the garage. <laughs> 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 but no, it was, it was a little bit, when I wasn't painting, I was playing. So it all worked out. And then that, that's how it led to Rob Zombie and led to Alice Cooper and all this other stuff that I ended up doing. That, I'm telling you. And, and Phil, before we go, I'm telling you, your fucking smile is infectious. Don't ever let it go because no. that's what's going to keep you going. I told you about Ed and everything. Yeah. Thanks, if man. you, your, your talent is wonderful, but have a great time on stage. We love our, our guests we have on, uh, Steve Brown and everything. Doug wouldn't have brought you on. There's something about you. You radiate. And and thank you so much for being part of our show tonight. Oh, man. So I had such a good time, man. Thank you so much, guys. Absolutely, man. Uh, Steve, next uh, one more from you. Okay. So going back to the dad thing. Your yeah. kids think you're cool? I um, love that question. Uh, they do. Um, I can think I'm cool. So. They don't? I don't know. They just... They just say, well, my oldest son, because I'm Psycho Steve, his name's Jack. So he's like, I have to come up with a name, too. I'm Jacko the Wacko. I'm like, perfect. You know? And then my youngest son, he's trying to, he always hits on my fiance, and he's just like, well, I'm Charming Charlie. Wow. So there you go. His kids say the greatest things. Exactly. And they're, they have no filter. They're like yoga pants. They don't lie. Like, even when my son was in kindergarten. <laughs> right? When my son was- when my son was in there, let's not talk about yoga pants. Okay. But when my son was uh, when my son was in in kindergarten, I was like, "Hey, dude, how you uh, how you doing kindergarten at school and stuff?" And he's like, oh, it's I like it. It's cool, you know." Um, some of the kids had crushes, and I'm like, "What? Wait, right. what? You got crushes?" He goes, "I have two. And, uh, and then he named and he goes Quinn and Mia, but don't tell mommy. She'll be devastated. <laughs> <laughs> like, thanks a lot. Let her go get me in the doghouse. <laughs> it was like so, so, uh, just to hear him say devastated. Right. Right? I'm like, wow, dude, you got some words on you. Nice. Oh, that's but great. They say yeah. the greatest things, but he, they do think, like, they do get the whole, why? Why do people want your picture? And, uh, but I try to like, we could be at Disney World, which we were one time. And this person was like, hey, can I get a photo? And I'm like, I'm kind of with my kids. And she's like, yeah, but I kind of came from Portugal. And I'm like, but I'm with my kids. I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want them to think all these, why do people want a picture with dad and stuff like this? I want it to be like a, a, as normal as possible. You know what I mean? I'm not John yeah. Joby. I can leave my hotel room, okay? So yeah, let me, you know. But uh, you know, I try to be really nice about it. But at the same time, you know. But oh wait, this is the best. 
we're we moved to Nashville. We're back in LA now. But when we when we first moved to Nashville, we went to the mall. My girl went to pick up a few things. My 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 son got his Wessel pretzel, and my daughter is sitting over here, and we're sitting at this thing, and this lady comes up, and even with the mask on, she goes, "Are you Phil?" And I'm like, "Pardon me." She goes, "Are you are you Phil?" And I could have told with the mask, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I had no idea. My stand, my son stands up, and the voice goes, "That's right, lady." This is Phil <laughs> Bitch! Hey, hey so Phil, awesome. I, get, I get the same Dude. thing. Dude, what? My, my That's other amazing. Hat is a congressman, and we walk around Disney. Fucking Steven Tyler came up to him and goes, I know who Tony Coelho is. And I'm going, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm supposed to be the famous. Fuck you. That's <laughs> but, so and, and, yeah, but I don't you love that? I so had funny. the guys here at Disney who were, you know, talked about these guys. They're like, oh my God, we watched the Metal Summit. I'm going, all right. <laughs> one guy asked if Jay sleeps upside down, but we get, won't even talk about that one. <laughs> wow. That was uh, that close. As soon as the topic came up, there it is. But no, <laughs> Phil, I, I totally get it. That, that that's great. But keep the smile, dude. Absolutely, Thanks, Thanks, guys. I've had so much fun talking to you guys, man. Thank you so much. Totally, Phil. Re uh, real quick before Angel, do we have any fan questions coming um, up that we need to get to? Just two quick fan questions. Sure. Um, give me a second. Oh, wait, give me a second. oh, okay. Here it is. Um. Can you talk oh. about playing Van, Van yeah. Halen two-handed, tapping licks with one hand? It's amazing. Caleb. Caleb Bradford. Yeah, yeah, nerd Halen. Yep. How many Van Halen guitars do you have, Caleb? Uh, <laughs> you, you have four that I've Adam never seen. Adam Reaver. You talk about the, the Van Halen two can tap. Eddie Van Halen. Van Halen. So Hardy. basically, I mean, I'm not plugged in or anything, but basically I uh, – Sometimes you get bored or you hit a plateau and nothing new is happening on guitar. And uh, so I'm sitting there going, what could I do now? And I thought, what What if I try to do the tapping part in eruption without tapping? So try to pick it. And uh, and then that's wow. that video that I put up on Instagram um, uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago where I just, it's kind of like, you're not going to hear it very well. Wait, I'm in the wrong key. That kind of thing, right? Yeah! <laughs> but the funny thing is, is even me thinking I could do that, this was a piece of cake. This, my fingers were like, fuck you. We don't do that shit. So <laughs> I just uh, I watched, I just put a movie on HBO and watched the movie for uh, about two hours and just did, oh man, what's gonna happen next? So, and then uh, I got it. So it took about maybe a couple of hours to get my fingers to do what they didn't want to do. And then I, I finished the piece. And the, the funny thing is, is I don't want to, you know, if I'm playing with the drills, I don't want to do that part of eruption. So I turned that technique into a bit that I do with the drills that you kind of hear a little bit of eruption, but that, that was for you, Caleb. I want to know how many Van Halen guitars you got. That's what I want to know. I'm going right to be on. <laughs> and if I don't do this next fan question, I'm going to end up getting killed before the new year. But okay. Uh, the last fan you question. Uh, and this is the last question. Okay. Candy, you know Burton. Yeah. Candy Burton. Candy um, Burton. She's from Toronto as well. Wow. Uh, is there a band or artist that you have yet to work with that you want to collaborate with in the future? Um, oh, man. Us. Uh, that's a tough one because, I mean, is it Jimmy Page? <laughs> Or is it Dave Grohl? I think. Yeah, but what would you dig deep into your your cubby hole? Your your, you know, who was that kid who made you play guitar? You know, yeah. would it be? See, Van Halen would have been an amazing thing, but he's not with us anymore. And I don't think it was live or dead in the question. So. What about you and Nuno doing a gig? We have. I mean, we never uh, 
worked on anything together, but we, we performed, he did a, we were doing this Lucky Strike Jam thing. And uh, he was, he wanted to do, he did a really cool version of Creep that he played a thing and I played second guitar and we had a blast. It was awesome. But it might be cool to co collaborate with him. Imagine Phil and Dave, with Dave Grohl. <laughs> I, got I, got, I got to hang out with the, the Foo Fighters. We, bon Jovi played Rock and Rio in 2019, and the Foo Fighters headlined the night before. So I went and hung out with those guys, and it was, it was an awesome hang. And then I got to watch them from side stage, and that was awesome too. So, And then you have to leave earlier. You'll never get out of there. <laughs> Absolutely. Ram, and, Ram is a great Phil, guy. And Phil, the, the last thing real quick is I think it's a cool little connection of, of your stuff that you've done. Talk briefly real quick about playing on Orianthe's record because you played on Believe where she hadn't really popped yet. And yeah. because she – I've i been an Orianthe person since day one because I loved her instrumental album, Violet Journey. Then people know that she was going to tour with Michael yeah. Jackson. And right. then she – I believe with the music videos that were on MTV kind of put her in the spotlight and then she joined Alice where well, you played on believe how did that happen well that, that was a again that was like a Howard Benson thing where oh. uh, yeah he, he produced a lot of amazing stuff and and uh, he had a meeting with her she wanted to use him and she goes I want another guitar player on the record and he was like oh my god it's probably gonna be someone like Steve I or something and she didn't know my name. She just said, I want the guy who played on the Daughtry record. Nice. And he said, oh, he called me and goes, hey, man, we're doing the Orianti record. Come in on Monday. And I'm like, okay. So, and it was cool because she, um, it's a kind of, it was a kind of situation where we record uh, the drums and the bass and the guitar all together. And if the guitar is if the guitar was keeper it was keeper and if it wasn't it wasn't but she would sing along and she didn't want to sing and play at the same time she wanted to concentrate on her vocal so that was the band it was i think it was abel boyle jr and paul bushnell on bass me on guitar and she would sing and then when she heard me play rhythm she was like why don't you do all the rhythms and i'll just solo and i'm like oh yeah okay no problem so <laughs> Ended up being like, you know, because she's a really, really, really great guitar player. Absolutely. And, and I like her voice, too. So it was really cool to be on that record. Absolutely. Well, Phil, we're going to cut you loose, man, because we want you to be able to enjoy your yeah. night. Phil, yeah. for people that are looking for you, where can you be found? Uh, right here. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see what else is happening. Oh, there's stuff like uh, check out the Kurt Dimer stuff because that's happening. Uh, more, drill, more Phil X and the Drills coming out in February. Yes. And possibly haven't been announced yet, but from some Bon Jovi dates this year. Nice. Hey, so, Phil, real quick before you go, right on. Is there any way artists like myself, which are doing things, are there a way for people to collaborate with you to work with you on projects? Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm I'm constantly working and constantly love. Uh, Creating and co-creating. Um, yeah. I'm working on something with hopefully Nick Perry soon and uh, right. uh, well, Mr. D Mr. Dougie. And I got a couple that, things in the works right now. There we go, but man. I, I, I you got my contact. All right. Get me involved, man. Absolutely. Phil, thank you so much, man. Yes. We can't thank, thank you enough, you. man. Enjoy your evening. Good luck with everything. Good luck with the drills, Bon Jovi, and all your other projects, man. Thanks, Put man. your feet up. Do what you got to do tonight. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you on a future episode. Bobby, did we miss the fireworks? Yeah, yeah well, they went on at 8. Tomorrow, they're, they're doing two shows. But tell your wife, look, the queen is at the kingdom, and I own this fucking place. <laughs> All right, buddy. Thanks, guys. Appreciate thank it. Man. You very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Absolutely. Metal Summoners, thank you guys so much for tuning in with us and wrapping up 2021 with us. This was a really special episode for us. We're about to hit 100. This was episode 98. And Metal Summoners, it's really all because of you. Phil, thanks you. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you, Phil. Phil. Thank you. Look forward thank to seeing you guys next year with everything that 2022 is going to bring with us. So as sure. always, guest announcement on Friday. It's going to be another bitchin' episode. We will see you guys next week on the Metal Summit. Make sure you're hitting us up, up on our socials. 
Phil's socials, the Metal Summit live on Facebook and on YouTube. That's where we're live. That's what you want to follow and subscribe to. But hit us up on Instagram and all of our personal socials. We appreciate you guys all so much for the Phil X, the real Phil X. For Bobby Dreyer, for Psycho Steve Presta, for Angel Alamo, I am Jay. Thank you guys so much. Guest announcement Friday, brand new episode on Wednesday. You guys rock. We love you. As always, you've been watching the Metal Summit. <laughs> <laughs> all on one practice. <laughs>